today, Republic Act II. And what I want to do is uh, continue with the uh, account of the various uh, figures, uh, various persons who uh, populate, who inhabit this dialogue, and who they are, uh, what they represent, and how they uh, contribute to the argument and the, and the structure of the work uh, as a whole. Last time, and I won't repeat this, last time you'll remember we, we, we talked briefly at the end of class about Cephalus and Socrates' uh, treatment of Cephalus, the, the embodiment of convention, uh, the embodiment of, of Athenian opinion, and the way in which Socrates, uh, Socrates as it were, uh, chases uh, Cephalus out of the dialogue, out of the, out of the conversation. We never hear from him again, and uh, the speakers are able, presumably, to pursue the audacious arguments uh, that will, will appear in the rest of the book without the oversight of the, uh, the head of the household, uh, the embodiment of conventional opinion. And Socrates next pursues this discussion with uh, the son of Cephalus, Polemarchus, the man who first uh, approached, uh, had, had uh, Socrates approached on, on the Piraeus. Polemarchus is described as the heir of the argument, as well as the, to be sure, the heir of the family fortune. Polemarchus is what the Greeks would call a gentleman. That is to say, he's a person willing to stand up for and defend his family and friends. I don't mean necessarily by a gentleman, somebody who holds the door for others or uh, so on, but somebody who stands up for his family and friends uh, in the way that he does. Unlike his father, however, Polemarchus shows himself concerned not just with the needs of the body, as Cephalus is represented, but Polemarchus is concerned to defend the honor and safety of the polis. He accepts the view uh, that justice is giving to each what is owed. But he interprets this to mean that justice means doing good to your friends and harm to your enemies. Justice, we might say, is a kind of loyalty. It is a kind of loyalty that we feel to members of a family, to members of our team, to, member, to fellow students of a residential college, and the kind of loyalty we feel to a place like Yale as opposed to all other places. That is to say, Polemarchus understands justice as kind of a, a kind of patriotic sentiment that citizens of one city or one polis feel for one another in opposition to all other places. Justice is devotion to one's own, and one's own is the good for Polemarchus. One's own is the just. But Socrates challenges Polemarchus on the grounds that loyalty to a group, any group, uh, cannot be a virtue in itself. And he trips Polemarchus up with a very, uh, in many ways, familiar Socratic argument. Do we ever make mistakes, uh, he asks Polemarchus. Isn't the distinction between friend and enemy based on a kind of knowledge, on a perception of who is your friend and who, who is your enemy. Have we ever mistaken friend for enemy? The answer seems to be, of course we have. We, we all know people who we thought to be our friends, but we found out uh, you know, that they were talking behind our backs or that they were operating to deceive us or in some way or another. Of course, it, it happens. It's happened to everyone. So how can we say that justice means helping friends and harming enemies, Socrates asks, when we may not even be sure who our friends and our enemies really are? Why should citizens of one state, uh, namely one's own, have any moral priority over the citizens of another state? When again, we don't know them, and we may well be mistaken in our assumption that they are 
enemies or, or friends, isn't, in other words, an, such an unreflective attachment to one's own bound to result in injustice to others, uh, Socrates seems to be asking uh, Palamarchus. Once again, in many ways, we see Socrates dissolving the bonds of the familiar. Uh, at no other point in the Republic, I think, do we see so clearly the tension between philosophical reflectiveness on the one hand and the sense of camaraderie, mutuality, and esprit de corps necessary for political life on the other. Socrates seems to dissolve those bonds of familiarity, loyalty, and attachment that, that we all have by saying to Palamarchus, how do we know, how do we really know uh, distinction between friend and enemy. But Palamarchus seems to believe that a city can survive only with a vivid sense of what it is, of what we might say what it stands for, and an equally vivid sense of what it is not and who are its enemies. Isn't this essential for the survival of any state, of any city, uh, to know who its friends and enemies are, uh, who its challenges are? Ch Socrates is dissolution of that very framework uh, challenges, it seems to me, the very possibility of political life by questioning the question or the distinction between friend and enemy. Although Palamarchus, like his father, is reduced to silence, it is, it is notable that his argument is not defeated. Later in the Republic, you will see, not, not that much later even, Socrates will argue that the best city may be characterized by peace and harmony at home, but this will never be so for relations between states. Uh, this is why even the best city, even Callipolis, will require, as he spends a great deal of time discussing, will require a warrior class, a class of what he calls auxiliaries. Auxi auxiliaries. War and the preparation for war is an intrinsic part of even the most just city. Even the platonic just city will have to cultivate uh, warrior citizens uh, who are prepared to risk life in battle for the sake of their own city. So in many ways, it seems that Palamarchus's argument, while apparently refuted in Book One, is rehabilitated and re, uh, re-emerges in its own way later in the dialogue. And we might want to think about this because it is an argument that is uh, very important to a contemporary uh, or 20th century, important 20th century political theorist by the name of Schmidt, uh, who made the distinction between what he called the friend and the enemy, right? You, you remember the central to uh, his understanding of politics. This is an argument uh, that comes from Palamarchus in Book One of, of the Republic. Palamarchus is dispatched in one way or another. And this creates the opportunity for the longest and in many ways most memorable uh, exchange in Book One and perhaps even the Republic as a whole, the exchange with Thrasymachus, who represents a far more difficult challenge in his own way than either of the first two speakers. Uh, in many ways, because Thrasymachus could be seen as uh, Socrates' uh, alter ego in some way, his sort of evil twin. Uh, he is, uh, how to put it, he is the Dr. Moriarty to uh, 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 Socrates' Sherlock Holmes, uh, you know, the evil doppelganger in some way. Thrasymachus' arrival of Socrates in many respects. He, is, he also, like Socrates, is a teacher, clearly. He is an educator. He claims to have a certain kind of knowledge of what justice is and claims to be able to teach it to others. Uh, he, he, he is a teaching a kind of, we will find out, a kind of hard-headed realism that expresses disgust at Palamarchus's talk about loyalty and friendship and the like. Uh, justice, he, uh, 
he asserts, is the, is the interest of the stronger. Every polity uh, of which we know is based upon a distinction between the rulers and the ruled. Justice consists of the rules, that is to say, that are made, for the bene made by and for the benefits of the ruling class. Justice is nothing more or less, right, than what benefits the rulers, the rulers who dis determine the laws uh, of justice. Thrasymachus is, of course, even for us today, a familiar kind of person. He is the intellectual. He who enjoys bringing, uh, you might say, the harsh and unremitting facts about human nature to light, who enjoys dispelling illusions and pretty be beliefs. Uh, he's the one who probably would be the first to tell you there is no Santa Claus. Uh, he, is the, he is that kind of uh, hard-boiled realist. No matter how much we may dislike him in some ways, one has to admit also there, there may be a grain, if, if not more than a grain, of truth in what he seems to be saying. And he, what he seems to be saying is this. Uh, we are beings who are first and foremost dominated by a desire for power. This is what distinguishes, uh, you might say, the true man, uh, the real man, from the, the, alpha, the alpha male, uh, you might say, from the slave. Power and domination are all we truly care about. And when we get later in the semester to Thomas Hobbes, think, rem remember Thrasymachus. I'll just say that for now. Remember Thrasymachus when we get to Hobbes. Power and domination are all we care about. And what is true of individuals is also true for collective uh, entities, collective nouns like states and cities. Every polity seeks its own advantage against others, making, you might say, relations between states uh, a condition of unremitting war of all against all. In the language, uh, if I can switch to the language of modern economics, uh, one could say that for Thrasymachus, politics is a zero-sum game. Uh, there are winners and there are losers. And the more someone wins, that means the more someone else will lose. And the rules of justice are simply the laws set up by the winners of the game to protect and to promote their own interests. It didn't take Karl Marx to invent or to discover that insight that uh, uh, you might say the rules of justice are simply the rules of the ruling class that, that comes straight out of, out of Thrasymachus, book one of the Republic. Well, how, how to respond? Uh, and again, Socrates challenges Thrasymachus with a variation of the argument that he'd used against Polemarchus. That is to say, do we ever make mistakes? That is to say, it is not self-evident or it is not always intuitively obvious uh, what our interests are. Uh, if justice is truly in the interests of the stronger, doesn't that require some kind of knowledge, some kind of reflection uh, on the part of those in power to know what is really and truly in their interests? People make mistakes, and it is very possible to mistake, uh, to make a mistake about your own interests. And of course, Thrasymachus has to acknowledge this. Of course, the rulers make mistakes, and he tries to invent an argument that if a ruler makes a mistake, he's not really a true ruler. The true ruler is the person who uh, both acts on his own interests and, of course, knows uh, what those interests are. But the point that he admits is all, in a sense, that Socrates needs. Justice is not power alone. Justice requires knowledge. Justice requires reflection. And that is, of course, at the core of the famous Socratic thesis, uh, that all virtue is a form of knowledge. All the virtues require knowledge and reflection uh, at their basis. But much of the exchange with Thrasymachus turns on the problem of what kind of knowledge justice involves. If justice is a kind of knowledge, 
if justice equals self-interest and self-interest requires knowledge, well, what kind of knowledge is that? Thrasymachus cont contends that justice consists of the art of convincing people to obey the rules that are really in the interests of others, the interests of their rulers. Justice, in other words, for Thrasymachus is a kind of sucker's game, uh, obeying the rules uh, that really benefit others, largely because we fear the consequences of injustice. Uh, justice is really something only uh, respected by the weak, uh, who are fearful of the consequences of injustice. Uh, again, the true, uh, uh, the, the, true the true ruler, in some ways, is one, Thrasymachus believes, who has the courage to act unjustly for his own interest. The true ruler, he says, is one who is like uh, a shepherd with a flock, but he rules not for the benefit of the flock, but of course for his own interests, the good uh, of the shepherd. Justice, like all uh, uh, knowledge, is really uh, a form, again, of self-interest. And so we, one can ask, right, is, is Thrasymachus wrong to believe this? And I, I realize I'm moving over this very quickly, but is Thrasymachus wrong to believe that? Uh, Socrates wins the argument in Book One with, with a kind of, you might even say, sleight of hand. Uh, both he and Thrasymachus believe that justice is a virtue, but Socrates says, what kind of virtue is it to deceive and fleece other people? Thrasymachus is forced to admit that the just person uh, is a fool, uh, Thrasymachus believes, is a fool for obeying laws that are, that are not beneficial to him, while the best life, Thrasymachus believes, is doing maximum injustice to others, doing whatever you like. And with that realization, we see a very dramatic moment in book one, even in the book as a whole, Thrasymachus blushes. He blushes when he begins to real, or when he realizes that he has, he has been defending the claim, not that justice is a virtue, but that justice uh, is something that, uh, that is really a form of, of, of weakness. Uh, Thrasymachus himself seems to be embarrassed by his defense of the tyrannical life, of, of, of the unjust life. Uh, the suggestion Plato seems to be making by making Thrasymachus blush is despite all of his tough talk, right, that he's not as, as tough as he, as he appears to be, as he wants to think of, of himself to be. He's shamed by the fact uh, that he has been defending injustice in the tyrannical way of life. Uh, and so it appears the three conversations end. Book one ends with uncertainty about what justice is. We have, we have had three views of Cephalus, Polymarchus, and Thrasymachus. They have all been refuted, or uh, been refuted, but no clear alternative seems to have emerged. Uh, certainly Socrates has not really proposed an alternative to Thrasymachus in his exchange with him. He has only, as it were, forced Thrasymachus to see that the logic of his ideas, the logic of his argument that justice is in the interests of the stronger is a defense of tyranny and is a defense of the unjust way of life. So all of book one is really a kind of warm-up for what follows uh, in the rest of the book. Uh, we find out, presumably, what, what justice is. Until then, uh, until that point, we have no reason to really give up on our uh, current uh, existing ideas about what justice is. And this is where the two most important figures of the Republic begin to make their voices heard. Those are Glaucon and Ediamantus. <coughs> Glaucon <coughs> tells Socrates that he is, dissat he is dissatisfied with the refutation of Thrasymachus, and so should we. Uh, Thrasymachus has been shamed. He has been forced to see the uh, uh, 
uh, logic, where the logic of his argument takes him. But that is not the same thing as being refuted. Uh, Thrasymachus is really, as it turns out, a kind of girly man uh, who is uh, ashamed to be seen defending the unjust life. But wh why should we be ashamed to praise injustice? Uh, Glaucon challenges Socrates. It is not enough to show that justice is wrong, Glaucon says. What we need is to hear why justice is good, or more precisely, to hear justice praised for itself. Is there, in your opinion, Glaucon asks Socrates, a kind of good that we would choose because we delight in it for its own sake? 358a. Is there a kind of good that we delight in for its own sake? And this is where the rubber hits the road. <coughs> Who is Glaucon? Uh, Glaucon and Adiamantus are the brothers of Plato. And other than their appearance in this book, <coughs> there is no historical record left about them. But Plato has given us enough. In the first place, they are young aristocrats, and Glaucon's desire to hear justice praised for its own sake indicates something about his scale of values. It would be vulgar, he believes, to speak of justice or any virtue in terms of material rewards or consequences. He does not need to hear justice praised for its benefits. Uh, he's indifferent to the consequences. Rather, he claims that he wants to hear justice defended the way that no one has ever defended it before. The brothers desire to hear justice praised for itself alone, and that seems to be expressive of their own freedom from mercenary r motives and incentives. It reveals to us something about their idealism and a certain kind of loftiness uh, of soul. And certainly the brothers, we find out, are not slouches. They are not slouches at all. Although it is easy to remember that later in the dialogue, most of their contributions seem to be of the form of yes, Socrates, no, Socrates. They seem to be rather passive uh, interlocutors. Their early challenges to Socrates show them to be potential philosophers. That is to say, the kind of persons who might one day rule the city. Of the two, Glaucon seems to be the superior. He is described as the most courageous, uh, which in that context <coughs> means the most manly, the most virile. And later, Socrates admits that he has always been full of wonder at the nature of the two brothers. And at 368a, he cites a line of poetry, uh, you remember, written about them for their distinction in battle. They have been in war. They have been tested uh, in war, obviously. They are also, and we see this from their relationship between one another and the way they speak to one another, they are also highly competitive super achievers, uh, a little bit like uh, some of you, perhaps. Uh, there is quite a bit of jousting between them uh, that you need to be attentive to. And each proposes to Socrates a test that he will have to pass in order to prove the value of justice and the just life. Glaucon goes on to rehabilitate the argument of Thrasymachus uh, in many ways in a more vivid and a more expressive way than Thrasymachus did himself. Glaucon tells a story, you remember. Yes. A story that he modifies from the historian Herodotus. Uh, a story about a man named Gyges who possessed a magic ring that conferred on him the power of invisibility. Who has not wondered what we would do if we had this power, the power of invisibility? Gyges, in, in Glaucon's retelling of the story, Gyges uses this ring to murder the king 
and to sleep with his wife and to set himself up as king. What would you do if you had this power, this power of this magic ring where you could commit any crime, indulge any vice, commit any outrage, and be sure you could always get away with it? Why, if you could do that, uh, would you wish to be just at the same time or wish to be just instead of that? This is the challenge that Glaucon poses to Socrates. Why would someone with absolute <coughs> power and complete immunity to punishment, why would they prefer justice to injustice? Tell me that, Socrates, Glaucon asks. If justice truly is something praiseworthy for itself alone, then Socrates should be able to provide an answer that will satisfy uh, Glaucon's retelling of the story of Gyges. That is certainly a very tall order. And that is where the brother, Adiamantus, chimes in. Adiamantus has a somewhat different set of concerns. He has heard justice praised his whole life from parents and from poets and from other authorities, but for the most part he has only heard justice praised again for the benefits justice confers both in this life and the next. Honesty is the best policy. Uh, we hear, we've heard Cephalus uh, con being concerned about <coughs> returning to others what you owe uh, as a way of pleasing the gods in the afterlife. And Adiamantus rightly takes this kind of argument to be to mean that justice is simply a virtue for the weak, uh, the lame, and the unadventurous. Uh, if you are only concerned with the consequences. A real man does not fear the consequences of injustice. Rather, Adiamantus' concern, and he gives a very revealing image of what he takes justice to be, is with an image of self-guardianship or self-control. He tells us at 367a that each would be his own guard. In other words, we should not care what people say about us, but we should be prepared to develop qualities of self-containment, autonomy, and independence from the influence that others can exercise over us. How can I develop those qualities of self-guardianship or self-control, he asks Socrates. And who has not felt that way before? The two brothers desire to hear justice praised for itself, Glaucon, and to live freely and independently, Adiamantus. And that shows to some degree, I think, uh, their own sense of alienation from their own society. If I can put the case for them slightly uh, anachronistically, these are two sons uh, of the upper bourgeoisie who feel degraded by the mendacity and the hypocrisy of the world they see around them. In any way, what, what person with any sensitivity to greatness has not felt this way at one time or another? The two are open to persuasion, to consider alternatives, perhaps even radical alternatives, uh, to the society that has nurtured them. They are, to put it another way, perhaps potential, not only potential rulers and potential philosophers, they may also be potential revolutionaries. And the remainder of the book is addressed to them and, of course, people like them. With the speeches of Glaucon and Adiamantus, you might say the circle around Socrates has effectively closed. He knows he will not be returning to Athens that evening. And he proposes instead, he proposes to the two brothers and those listening to the conversation a kind of thought experiment that he hopes will work magic on the two. Let us propose, he says, to watch a city coming into being in speech. Let us create a city in speech. It is easier, he says, to view justice, uh, not to view justice microscopically in an individual, but rather, let's view justice, as it were, through a magnifying glass. Let's view justice 
in the large sense. Let us view justice in a city in order to help us understand what it is in an individual. And this idea that the city is essentially analogous to the soul, that the city is, is like the soul, is the central metaphor around which the entire republic is constructed. It seems to be presented entirely innocuously. No one in the dialogue objects to it, yet everything else follows from this idea that the, that the city, the polis, is in certain essential respects like an individual, like the soul of an individual. What is Socrates trying to do here? And what is that metaphor, that central metaphor, in what function does it serve within the work? To state the obvious, uh, Socrates introduces this analogy to help the brothers better understand what justice is for an individual soul. The governance of the soul, Adiamantus' standard of self-control, uh, must be like the governance of a city in some decisive respects. But in what respects? How is a city like a soul? And in what respect is self-governance, the control of one's passions and appetites, in what respect is self-control like the governance of a collective body. Consider the following example. When we say that so-and-so is typically American, or typically, to take Taiwanese, for example, we mean that that person expresses certain traits of character and behavior that are broadly representative, in some way, of the cross-section of their countrymen. Is, that, is this a useful way to think? Uh, more specifically, what does it mean to say that an individual can be seen as magnified in his or her country, or that one's country is simply the collective expression of certain individual traits of character? That seems to be what Socrates is suggesting, R right? Is that what he's, he's getting at? One way of thinking about the metaphor of city and soul together is to think of it as a particular kind of causal hypothesis uh, about the formation of both individual character and political institutions. In this reading of the city-soul analogy as a kind of causal relation uh, maintains the view that, indi that as individuals we both shape and determine the character of our societies, and that those societies in turn shape and determine individual character. The city and soul analogy could be seen then as an attempt to understand how societies reproduce themselves and how they shape citizens who again in turn shape the societies in which they uh, inhabit. That seems to be one way of making sense of the city-soul uh, hypothesis, but in w again, it doesn't seem to answer the question in what way are cities and individuals alike? To take the American case, for example, uh, does it mean that something like uh, the presidency, the Congress, and, this, and the court uh, can be uh, discerned within the soul of every American citizen? I mean, that would be absurd uh, to think that, obviously. I mean, I think it would be absurd. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to argue it and we could have a discussion. But uh, it might mean that uh, American democracy or democracy of any kind uh, helps to produce a particular kind of democratic soul. Uh, just like, you might say, the old regime in France, the old aristocratic society existing before the revolution tended to produce a very different kind of soul, a very different kind of individual. Every regime will produce a distinctive kind of individual, and this individual will come to embody the dominant, the dominant character traits of the particular regime. The remainder of the Republic is again devoted to crafting a regime that will produce a distinctive kind of human character. And that, of course, is why the book uh, is a utopia. 
There has never been a regime in history that was so single-mindedly devoted to the end of producing that rarest and most difficult species of humanity called simply philosopher. So, city and soul. That leads to our next topic that I want to pr pursue for the, uh, for the remainder of the class, the reform of poetry and the arts. Socrates' city and speech proceeds through several stages. The first stage proposed by Adiamantus is the simple city, what he calls the city of utmost necessity. That is, a, a city limited to the satisfaction of certain basic needs. The primitive or simple city, the, sim the city of utmost necessity, again, it expresses the nature of Adiamantus' own soul. There is a kind of noble simplicity in him that treats subjects as bodies or creatures of limited appetites. The simple city is little more than a combination of households designed for the sake of securing one's existence. And at this point, and you can hear his brother uh, chastising him, at this point Glaucon retorts that it seems as if his bro it seems as if Adiamantus has created a city only fit for pigs, a city of pigs. Are we only such that we want to feed at a common trough? Uh, is there nothing more to, s to politics than that? And Glaucon says, where are the luxuries? Where are the relishes, he asks? Where are the things that make up a city? And to here too, Glaucon's city expresses his own tastes and his own soul. The warlike Glaucon would preside over what Socrates calls a feverish city, one that institutionalizes honors, competitions, and above all, war. If Adiamantus again expresses the appetitive part of the soul, Glaucon represents that quality that Plato calls spiritedness, or thumos in Greek. Spiritedness is the central psychological quality of the Republic. The entire thrust of the book is devoted to the taming of spiritedness and to the control of spiritedness. Spiritedness, spiritedness is that quality of soul that is most closely associated with the desi desires for honors, fame, and prestige. It is a higher order psychological quality. It is what dis seeks distinction, the desire to be first in the race of life and lead us to seek to dominate others. We all know people of this sort, do we not? And we all, to some degree, embody this quality in ourselves. It is the quality that we associate <coughs> with being a kind of alpha personality. Uh, this is the issue for Socrates, how to channel this wild and untamed passion of spirit or heart, how to channel this to some kind of common good? Can it be done? How can we begin the domestication of the spirited Glaucon? The rest of the book is to some degree about taming, whether asking the question whether Glaucon can be tamed. And it is here that Socrates turns to his first and perhaps even his most controversial proposal for the establishment of the just city. The creation of the just city can only begin, he says, with the control of music, poetry, and the arts. And this is where s Plato's image uh, as an educator derives. The first order of business for the founder of a city, any city, is the oversight of education. In his proposals for the reform of poetry, especially Homeric poetry, represent clearly a radical departure from Greek educational practices and beliefs. Why is this so important for Socrates? Ask yourself, if you were founding a city, 
uh, where would you begin? Uh, Socrates' belief or his argument seems to be something like this. Uh, it is from the poets, and I mean that in the broadest sense of the term, myth makers, storytellers, artists, musicians, Today, we might say uh, film producers and film and television producers. It is from these people that we receive our earliest and most vivid impressions of heroes and villains, uh, gods, uh, and the afterlife. These stories, the stories we hear from earliest childhood on, shape us in some very meaningful sense for the rest of our lives. And the Homeric epics or, of course, for the Greeks, what the Bible was for us, maybe even is in some communities. The names of Achilles, Priam, Hector, Odysseus, Ajax, these would have been just as familiar and important to the contemporaries of Plato as the names of Abraham, Isaac, Joshua, and Jesus are for us. Plato's critique of Homeric poetry in the Republic is twofold. It is both theological and political. Maybe you might even say, following Spinoza, that this is the core of, Spino of, of Plato's theological political uh, treatise here. Uh, the theological critique is that Homer simply depicts the gods as false, as fickle and inconstant. He presents them as beings who are unworthy of our worship. Uh, more importantly, the Homeric heroes are said to be bad role models for those who follow them. They are shown to be intemperate in sex, overly fond of money, and to these vices Socrates adds cruelty and disregard for the dead bodies of the opponents of one's opponents. The Homeric heroes are ignorant and passionate men full of blind anger and desire for retribution. How could such figures possibly serve as good role models for citizens of a, a just city? And Socrates' answer is, of course, the purgation of poetry and the arts in books two and three. He wants to deprive poets of their power to enchant. And something Socrates admits in the 10th book of the Republic to which he, uh, he himself has been highly susceptible to the enchantment uh, of the poets. How we need to deprive, again, the poets, the, uh, the song makers, the lyricists, the musicians, the myth makers, the storytellers, all of them, the power to enchant us. Uh, and in place of the pedagogical power of poetry, Socrates proposes to install philosophy in its place. As a result, the poets will have to be expelled from the city. Imagine that. Sophocles will be expelled from the just city uh, that Socrates wants to create. This always raises the question that you will discuss in your section, whether or not Socrates' censorship of poetry and the arts is an indication of his totalitarian uh, impulses. This is the part of the Republic most likely to call up our own First Amendment uh, instincts. Uh, who are you, Socrates, we are inclined uh, to ask, to tell us what we can read, hear, and listen to. And furthermore, uh, Socrates seems to be saying not that the Callipolis will have no poetry in music, it will simply be Socratic poetry and music. And here's another question, which you will no doubt be concerned to discuss, namely, what would such Socratically purified music and poetry <coughs> look like? What would it sound like? I don't know that I have an answer to this, but perhaps the Republic as a whole is itself a piece of this Socratic poetry that will substitute for the Homeric kind. But it's important to remember that uh, the question of education and the question of the reform and censorship and control of poetry is introduced in the context of taming the warlike passions of Glaucon and others like him. 
The question of censorship and the telling of lies is introduced, in other words, as a question of military necessity, controlling the guards or the auxiliaries of the city, its warrior class. Nothing is said here about the education of farmers, artisans, merchants, laborers, the economic class. Maybe to speak bluntly, Socrates just doesn't care that much uh, about them. It's okay what they listen to. Uh, nor has anything really been said up to this point about the education of the philosopher. His interest here is in the creation of a tight and highly disciplined cadre of young warriors who will protect the city much as watchdogs protect their own home. That is to say, recalling Palamargus, those who are good to friends and bark and growl at strangers. Such individuals will substitute their own desires and pleasures to the group uh, and live a life by a strict code of honor. We have to ask, are Socrates' proposals unrealistic? Are they undesirable or are, are they desirable? Uh, they are not undesirable if you believe, as he does, that even the best city must provide provisions for war and therefore a warrior's life a soldier's life will require harsh privation <coughs> in terms of material rewards and benefits as well as a willingness to sacrifice for others. It would seem far from being unrealistic, uh, Socrates engages what we might call maybe a kind of Socratic realism. Far more unrealistic would be the belief of those who argue, and I'm thinking here of names like Immanuel Kant and others from the 18th and 19th century, that one day we can abolish war altogether and therefore abolish the passions that give rise to conflict and war. So far, Plato believes, is the passionate or spirited aspect of human nature remains strong, so long will it be necessary to educate the warriors of society who defend it. So on that I'm going to end today and next time we will talk about justice, the philosophers and Plato's discovery of America. <laughs> <laughs>